Looks like I'm live. All right, I'll give it a couple of minutes as I normally do. Take my obligatory sip of water. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Welcome to uh, today's installment of Geek Speaks Greek. I'm your geek, George O'Connor. Clearly speaking English, but speaking Greek in the sense that I am going to be like in every episode. Uh, of Speak Geek Speaks Greek, I talk about a different personage from uh, Greek mythology, be they goddess, god, hero, or monster, or maybe in the case of today's episode, Titan. I guess that counts as a god, right? Um, so I'm happy to report. So on Monday's episode, we covered um, the Earth itself, Gaia, you know, the planet we all live on, the goddess we all live on. And I figured I would kind of like do like our, our, our general neck of the solar system, starting at home at Earth, right? And then today, it was a little bit of a, it was a little bit up in the air. Was it going to be Helios, the sun, or was it going to be Selene, the moon? And I basically said, it comes down to, if we're going to have a sunny day, and goodness knows, I needed a sunny day. If we were to have a sunny day, it was going to be Helios. And folks who are not in New York City or the surrounding environs, I'm very happy to report, it's very sunny today. I got two of my cats sleeping on the window still over there. Third one's walking around my feet, will probably trip me up at some point. But um, it's sunny, it's beautiful, it's a happy day. So we're going to talk Helios. Uh, before we get into that, if you've uh, never joined us before, uh, I start off, um, turns out the audience, the people who watch this, incredibly talented artists, incredibly active in the community. Uh, I'm always getting these amazing submissions of art, and I have a lot to share today. I know I say it every day, but I have a lot to share today. So I'm going to uh, call up some of these pieces of art and share them. Hopefully get through most of it. I don't think I maybe got a little bit more than I could handle in one setting. Um, so this is from, oh, I should really get their name before I start talking, right? Uh, come on. Well, maybe I won't. So this is, I'm going to get their name in a second. Here we have, it's going to, I know the words are backwards, I'm going to read it. This is because we did last week, we did Hermes and Pan in Redo Week. Here is Hermes proudly presenting, look how cute. That's maybe the cutest baby Pan. Like it's, I mean, my baby Pan, I gave him like skinny legs, but these, this Pan's got like cute little chubby legs. This is so cute. And he's going, look at this neat little baby I made. <laughs> it's like, whoa, calm down there, buddy. Um, hmm. and then the next panel is all the Olympians just going, ooh, and all. even look at Poseidon. Poseidon's even like, oh, and he's got a little heart above his head. Like, that's the first time and only time you'll probably ever see Poseidon with a heart above his head. And there's Hera, and there's Artemis, and there's, uh, that's, uh, Athena, and I think, let me look at it this way. That's Apollo. I kind of thought it was Dionysus for a second. I'm like, I'm not sure Dionysus would be around. Actually, it's a good question. Who do you think is older, Dionysus or Pan? I don't know. Uh, so that is from... That is... Oh, well, okay. This is why I didn't remember the name, because the name is Little Cereal. Huh. Is that, was that your given name? Great job, Little Cereal. That's really good work. I love when people kind of do these, like, like these vignettes where they, we see scenes of the actual characters. Um... Okay, so let's see what else we have here. Um, this is... Oh, so uh, as I mentioned, on Monday we did Gaia. So this is... Oh, this is really cool. So, you know, one of the things I talked about, when I draw Gaia in the books, I basically draw her as either the actual Earth or I draw her as like a crack in the earth that speaks from it. Look at this version of Gaia where she's almost like a tree. Like her feet have actually given, like they're growing out of the earth. And we talked about that idea and I kind of drew the, my world's worst picture of the idea of Gaia like being able to grow human forms of herself. And also, I mean, look at the flower on her name. This is great. Um, so that is from Ilya. Ilya, you've sent us some really beautiful work over the, day, over the years. Over the years. That's, we haven't done this for years. Uh, something's going on with my iPad today, everybody. I'm sorry. It's getting stuck a little bit. Um, here we go. This is... So we just heard from Elia, and now we hear from Ella. And um, she also drew a Gaia. 
And over here, I don't know if you've seen this in previous episodes. I don't know what these things are called. They're these little plastic things. You kind of melt them together. They've made like an entire pantheon of Olympians. And now they've added Gaia to it too, which is like, that's so awesome. And all these, seeing these like human variations, like humanoid forms of Gaia really make me kind of want to like put that in a book. I don't know if I could stick it in Dionysus still. It might be a little bit... Um, might be a little bit like last minute. So these are from, uh, this is from Nora and Drake. We've seen their work before. Um, here's Drake's version. Very nice. Really using the entire page there too. And then here, this is super cool. You know, we're talking about the idea of creating whole, so, mm, the idea of creating whole scenes. So here is Athena standing atop Gaia. How clever is that? Like this is, I see stuff like this sometimes like, why don't I think of drawing that? So, I mean, you guys have it now. You've seen, they thought of it first. So um, that, oh, by the way, I didn't mention Drake's thing. That was actually um, Zeus being punished in Tartarus beneath Gaia. So it's like, wow. Because we talked about, like, Gaia is kind of the one who's, like, she's really been after the Olympians. If you look in the books, it's kind of a recurring theme. She's always going after them. Uh, this one, so this is, you remember I did what I can only qualify as a, a kind of stinky drawing of maybe, like, Mother Earth coming out. So this is one of those drawings where somebody took my drawing and made it better. This is from Mashea. Look how great. Like, that's just like, that's like the concepts I was talking about and utterly failed to execute. Like where she's got, she has like this river crossing over her, her tree, like the, like the trees are making up her clothing and stuff. And like, the more I think about this, the more I really have to make um, a humanoid Gaia or Gaia. Um, here we have, um, this, oh, this is from Yehi, who is like, you know, she's been sending in like, she sends in multiple pieces each day. Pretty amazing work. Um, and I guess we had the discussion that came up whether or not, like, who would be the best ruler if Zeus was not the ruler? Because we all decided, like, they could probably do better than Zeus. And this is a depiction of Hera as the only ruler. Look at her holding the little tiny scales of justice. I like that her, she's got this crown. If you look, the crown, the shapes are reminiscent of what you would see on, well, I don't know what to do in my head, of like a peacock's crown, like, I mean, feathers, which all that makes sense. And that's just beautiful work. And then <laughs> this is, I'm, this is a little bit of a comic because you know, yeah, he does comics. I've actually, I officially got permission to start posting stuff. So later today, I'm going to start posting some of her comics and I have a lot to post. I feel like my Instagram post has become like the all yeah, he channel because she's done so much great work. But this is a little funny bit of Artemis and Pan because we talked about them as gods of the wild. How did they feel about her? And they're seeing that what they thought was tiny Gaia is really not so tiny at all. Pretty cool coloration on Gaia too. I like the luminescent green eyes. The white hair is interesting. I'm curious as to how you arrived at that. Maybe it's like a snow-capped mountain? Um, and let's see. Oh, and here's something from someone we haven't heard from in a little bit. This is from uh, Joseph... And I think for the first time, Joseph's sister, Juliet. So first, Joseph drew Baby Pan, always popular. Baby Pan kind of looks a little bit like me, which makes sense because, like, you know, I basically drew Pan to look like me. And then we have adult Pan, who definitely looks like me. I mean, that's look, the nose is even kind of bent in the same spot. And then, wrapping this up, Here's Juliet's version. Like, it runs in the family. Super talented family. This is amazing. Um, let's see. Uh, oof. Am I going to get through all these? There's so many more. Okay. Um, let's take a little bit. Okay. So, um, this is from Megan, who has written in some... Megan's the one who does the shipping of um, Hermes and uh, Athena. Uh Here's another example of somebody taking my really crummy drawing of Gaia and improving on it. So here she has Gaia kind of growing out of the mountains. The same idea where the vegetation's on her clothing and everything. And if you're wondering about that figure behind her, that's Uranus, the sky, 
who would like had been vaguely humanized at points. I've anthropomorphized him in the story. He has somewhat of a body. So this is like this nice moment of wedded bliss. Like, you know, like I guess before I guess before she arranged to have their kids, like, you know, overthrow him and banish him. So like this is the moment they're in this embrace. And like I'm like, that's really great too. And then she also drew I mean I don't think I need to say who this guy is. <laughs> I love the attention. Not only, all right, first off, also she drew me in my favorite shirt. I don't know if you've ever noticed it. I've worn it a few times on here. It looks like it's, it's actually a t-shirt, but it has like a needlepoint dinosaur design. And uh, the name of the t-shirt is called My Grandma Loves Dinosaurs. And it's just hilarious. It's really good. Like, actually, she made me better looking than I'm in real life. But, and uh, I love it. I love it so much. Let's do... Uh, oh, we got, we had two more. I know I'm going, I know I'm going a little far here, but I'm sorry. Uh, there's just that there's so much cool stuff. Oh, what's going on here? All right. So this one, this is from Moira who drew, this is another Gaia in earth form. And that's kind of cool. Again, that idea that she's growing out of the earth. And I really like this. I compared it to, um, the idea of like, uh, in Guardians of the Galaxy 2, the way Kurt Russell ego grows a little ego person out of the whole planet. I mean, this works for me. And then here, this is the last bit, another talent family. So um, this is by Ranka. She did a really amazing pan. There's his pan pipe. I like the way she, I mean, just like, that's just a great drawing. Now Ranka, I don't know if you remember this, her family has on occasion, her parents have drawn pictures too. And uh, I think this came from Ranka's mom. Let's see if I can open it. No, I can't. Something's going on with my computer right now. Uh, let's just give it one more shot, huh? I know this is not the most exciting thing to watch, but it really came out good. I can't do it right now. I'll try to post it up later because it was really funny. I don't know what's going on. So thank you, everybody, who sent in your drawings. Um, if you uh, want to join in with this sort of thing, sending in drawings of whoever you want, be it someone we've covered or someone we haven't covered or someone we'll cover today, send it to me, please, in my email at georgeoconnorbooks at gmail.com. And if you've ever missed an episode and you want to go back and see, or see another one again or just to like, you know, kind of go through and freeze frame all the awesome drawings people did, go to my YouTube dot com slash user george olympians i used to say it was a pretty incomplete list up there because we missed the first two episodes but we redid those in redo week and in fact they were better the second time around so uh you're not missing anything go up there and see every lecture with the exception of those two that we've done so far so man that was a lot of art i know <sighs> today because in honor of the sunny day like staring at my kittens basking in the sun we're going to talk about helios and helios is literally the sun, as far as the Greeks believed, right? Just the same way Gaia, the goddess of the earth, was literally the earth, Helios was literally the sun. The, uh, the Romans called him Sol, but uh, S-O-L, not S-O-U-L or S-O-L-E, but pronounced the same way. So Hyperion is, uh, I'm not Hyperion, that's his dad. Okay, good. I was thinking uh, Helios is a titan. And it's one of those things, like, are the second generations titans? And I've come down, in my personal belief, I'm calling him a titan, you know? So his dad is the titan Hyperion. His mom is the titan Thea, or Thea. And they had three pretty well-known kids, especially in terms of, you know, playing around, uh, of, like, how we view stuff on Earth. There's Hyperion, I'm, gosh, I really hope I don't keep doing that. There's Helios, the sun. There's Selene, the moon, who we're going to be doing on Friday now, since today was sunny. And then there's Eos, the dawn. Dawn's kind of a harder concept to work in there, because the other two have very concrete celestial bodies we can look at. I could go upstairs, like, uh, upstairs, I could go outside right now and look at the sun. Later tonight, I could go and look at the moon. Eos, the rosy-fingered dawn, as she's almost always referred to, there's not, like, actually something floating in the sky of her, but she, I mean, we've all seen the way that the sun, like, as it comes up in the morning, or maybe we haven't, maybe you're not a morning person, but there, she's like that pinkish glow that comes and chases Nyx away from our world. Nyx is the night. You can see that as another episode on the YouTube. So, um, Helios. Let's see, what should we talk about him? Um, he actually has, he's a really interesting character. So like, he's not an Olympian, certainly, but he has a great deal of prominence. 
You know, sometimes like if you're not like on the Olympian circle, you don't really appear in a lot of myths. He has a he appears a fair deal. Uh, he also um, has a, a, like a lot of notable sources of worship in the ancient world, um, and uh, he has a lot of kids. Not so many super. There's not a hundred. Uh, well, I mean, there actually there probably has a hundred kids. He's kind of he's kind of bad that way. But he doesn't. He's not like Zeus, where there's a lot of kids that are super famous. He's got two kids that are really well known. There's there's Cersei, who we're definitely going to do in a future episode, because like Cersei's definitely having her moment thanks to Madeline Miller's terrific book. And then there's Phaethon, who's his son. We're going to talk about him later. Um, I think at this point I kind of want to draw my first picture of. Helios. And because in my personal thing, I decided again, second generation, sometimes they're Titans like Atlas. And sometimes they're maybe not quite Titans like Prometheus. And I feel like being the sun puts you into the realm of being a Titan. You're going to be really big. And to me, that's important. So when I draw him, but he's also, he's completely luminescent. Like, not luminescent. That makes him sound like he just glows in the dark. He's purely luminous. He just gives off. He is the sun. You can't look at this guy or you'll burn your eyes out. Which is ironic because he's very much associated with sight. Again, we'll talk about that later. So I gave him kind of the stature of the way I drew the Titans. They're basically humanoid. But they're a bit elongated. And they have, I don't know if anyone else notices it. I give them kind of a, a weird body posture where they're kind of, they loom in a certain way. And I give that with Hyperion. Oh, gosh, I am going to do it. With Helios, too. Because he is so, he's just glowing from within, there's actually not a lot of detail on his body. So he's something I could draw really quickly. He's almost like the silhouette. Incredibly long. With a few flames coming off him. When I color him in my books, you'll see a lot of times... I actually kind of break the lines where he's just like the lines are literally diffused. Like the black line that contains it, it's kind of like there's a light spray over it to give the fact that he's just glowing. If, if, in an ideal world, like if you were reading his book, like the way I could do it, there'd be like little lights in the page that would shine through and be like, ah, I can't look at him. If we ever do an Olympians cartoon, like that would be the way to do it. Like he'd be just, he'd be lit from behind him, just literally glowing. So here he is standing. I don't have room for his feet. Not a very exciting pose there. I mean, we've seen more exciting than this. So the idea of him, where he is literally the sun, right? He's not just dragging the sun around in a chariot. He is the sun being dragged around the chariot. And the way the ancient Greeks thought of this, and if you remember what we talked about with Gaia on Monday, uh, originally the envisioning of the earth was like it was a kind of disc. The Greeks figured out that the Earth was a globe before, I, ch I checked afterwards, before everybody else. So way to go, ancient Greeks. You guys are super smart. Um, there was mountains ringing this world. And outside of that was the river Oceanus. And he had a palace. Helios had a palace somewhere over here. You can't really tell. It's meant to be like in the ocean or beyond the ocean. It was some place you couldn't get to. And every day from the east, Helios would rise above it all in his chariot. And he himself, like I said, he's the sun. So he's just this glowing force. He had four horses that pulled his chariot. Depending on the sources, they had different names. And some sources they didn't. But it's kind of like, I guess it's kind of like Santa Claus. <laughs> and these four flaming horses pulled him across the sky. And everyone down here, let's just draw some land masses and some oceans and stuff. They would see him as he flew over everything. And it's this, this idea that he's above all, that he flies above all, is where he gets associated so much with the concept of sight. And I'll get to that in a little bit. After, you know, he crests midday, he comes down. And he lands. Here's the Asperides, you know, the garden that's sacred to Hera. And I assume, actually, this is where Atlas is, too, because he's near the Hesperides. So he's holding up the earth, like, from one end, which has got to make it super hard. Uh, I mean, the sky from one end. And he comes, he lands in the water, Helios. And then, because they didn't have the idea, at least initially when they conceived of Helios, you, you know, we know that, well, we, the sun doesn't travel around us. We're rotating around the sun. But essentially, it looks like the sun goes around a big loop, right? 
but as far as the ancient Greeks could tell, the really ancient Greeks, they just saw the sun settle into the ocean because that's what it looks like when you see it set on, settle in the west. So then they believed that he took a little boat. Well, it probably wasn't that little because it was in he was in it. It was a golden boat. It was made for him by Hephaestus himself, and he would take this boat and he would sail back around to the other side, to the east, and then he'd begin this all over again. And he did this every single day, with one big exception, which I'll get to shortly. Um, so let's, before I get into that story, which is going to be the big story here, I want to talk a little bit about the fact that he is so closely associated with sight. And I've even seen it said that he is considered the god of sight, which I'm not really sure that's an official thing or somebody was just kind of being clever. But if you think about, like, if you've read my books and if you know the myths, you could like some of the biggest roles he has played has been in the role of just the guy who sees everything going on because the sun rises above all. The sun is there all the time, right? Well, not all the time, not at night, but during the day, you can't hide from the sun because he could see everything. I mean, I guess you could be inside, but so the first time he really plays a significant role. We see him right away. He's um he's in Zeus. He's in other books. In fact, it's become very popular in your art that you send in to draw like Helios just in the skies and sun, which I love. That's just a great detail. Yeah, we're talking mythological themes. The sun is Helios. That's how it should look. Um, but in the book Hades, Hades, Lord of the Dead, he's in love with Cora, the daughter of Demeter, and he abducts her. Now, he has Zeus's permission. Zeus is, you know, Cora's dad. And it's not great that he does that, but, you know, he, he did something, I guess. But they, they purposely, the two brothers, Hades and Zeus, keep this a secret from Demeter. So Demeter is literally out of her mind with grief. Her beloved daughter has disappeared. She has no idea where. She just knows that she was in a field and there was a huge, something opened up the ground and swallowed her whole. Actually, she doesn't even know about the ground opening because like, it closes again. She just has literally no idea. And she's wandering around the world lost. And while she's wandering around the world, things stop growing because she enables things to grow. And we have the first winter while she's sad. And this first winter lasted a really long time, right? And finally, she encounters Hecate, who we've also did an episode. You know what? You can go back. And you can see that episode on youtube.com slash user slash George Olympians. Hecate is the goddess of crossroads and travelers and boundaries. And Hecate hands her a torch and she's like, I don't know what happened to your daughter, but I know someone who would. And she takes Demeter to see Helios. And Helios, of course, did see. And he's like, yeah, he got carried off by H Hades. So Helios kind of... Tattletailed, but it's okay because what Hades did was not great and all worked out for the best anyway. So that's his first big role he plays. Then there's another big role he plays in the book Hephaestus, which I actually have right in front of me. And in this one, well, <clears throat> we know by the time of the Trojan War that Hephaestus and Aphrodite have gotten a divorce. And the reason they got a divorce is because something that happens in this book. When Aphrodite first appeared, from when she first was the self-made goddess, the almost the entire assemblage of Olympians was there. The only ones missing were Aphrodite herself and Hermes and Dionysus who hadn't been born yet. And Aphrodite makes this splash on the scene and upsets the whole order because she's so powerful. If you've watched my episode of Aphrodite, in my opinion, she's the most powerful of all the gods because she has this ability to make you fall in love with anything. And she could just destroy any union or create any union just by virtue of her power. It's kind of like terrifying how powerful she is. And when she first appears, she's not super careful about making friends, right? So Zeus, who feels very threatened by this very powerful goddess, and who, you know, normally Zeus is like, you're pretty, let's, like, let's change numbers. He's like, no, she could destroy me. And the one thing we know Zeus likes to do is hold on to his power very jealously as he can. So he marries her off without any consent of her own, or really of Hephaestus' own, to his son Hephaestus, who is widely considered the most harmless god. He's just kind of like, you know, I mean, if you've, we've talked about Hephaestus, people pick on him a lot. It's kind of sad. And Hephaestus, I think he did love Aphrodite, but she was too much for him. And Aphrodite isn't really someone to be tied down to just one person. Because she's the goddess of love. She has a lot of love to give, right? Um, <clears throat> so eventually, to cut out a lot of stuff, she starts having an affair 
with the brother of Hephaestus, Ares. And it's kind of a weird mix because she's love and he's war, but like they both have potential for a lot of destruction. Um, you know, all's fair in love and war is an expression. Maybe there's a connection there. I don't know. And they're doing this in secret without Hephaestus knowing. And of course, who knows? But Helios, he who rises above it all, he who sees everything. So here's another story where in this one, Hephaestus is working in his workshop and Helios comes and tells him like, hey, got some bad news. Saw Ares going <laughs> into your wife's house where you were gone. Think they're having an affair. And that kind of sets the motions in the book Hephaestus. Like Hephaestus takes his revenge because Hephaestus, like he's super nice and super sweet, but he's been dumped on his entire life. The dude's, he's, he's the god of volcanoes for a reason. He has a lot of pent up anger and tension and it kind of comes out and he makes this knit that's like one molecule thin but unbreakable and has it drop on his, his wife and his brother so they get caught and he holds up a ridicule for the other gods. Then later on he does beats the poop out of Ares, which is pretty, I have to admit, that's a pretty like satisfying moment. I'm like, yeah, yeah, Ares deserved that for that one. But another instance where he's this guy who sees all and tells. And again, like, okay, it kind of like, it could be a tattletale thing, you know. We, if you have siblings, you know the thing where like your, your brother or sister's doing something wrong and you tell your mom and they're like, you know, nobody likes the tattletale. It's like, but I'm upholding the order. Um, <laughs> so maybe he just did it because, I mean, we know Hephaestus made him his boat. I think Hephaestus made him his chariot too. So, you know, he owes Hephaestus or maybe he just liked causing trouble or maybe, I don't know what his thing was, but there's like a couple of stories like that where he's just kind of the guy who sees what goes on. Now, a few more stories of him to tell quickly because I'm going pretty long. Um, this is a really interesting one about him. Helios uh, much like Apollo, and we'll get around to the connection between those two later, has a herd of sacred cattle. These cattle are immortal, which is makes for one of the, for my opinion, one of the most disturbing scenes in the Odyssey where the scene happens. A lot of people forget this. When you think of the Odyssey, when you think of Odysseus and his attempts to get home, we tend to think of Poseidon as the big obstacle. And to be sure, Poseidon is the big obstacle. But the kind of really big, one of the final blows comes as a result of Helios, and we kind of overlook this. So over the course of the story, two different people warn, people with the power of precognition, warn Odysseus, you know what? You're going to come to an island where there's going to be these beautiful cows. They're going to look delicious. You're going to be really hungry, but these cows are owned by the god of the sun, Helios himself, and if you eat them, you're all going to die. Two different people tell them this, and sure enough, they come to this island, and sure enough, the cows look beautiful, and sure enough, the men are hungry, and even though Odysseus is like, guys, remember, Tiresias, and I forgot the other person's name, they told us not to eat these cows, They're like, don't worry, what these cows, they totally eat the cows, except for Odysseus. So, I mean, first off, you were the dumbest sailors who ever lived, like, why, why? And this is what's really disturbing. These cows are immortal, right? So, they're being eaten They've been cut up and Homer describes that they're still moving. So it's like they're still alive and they kind of keep regenerating. So these dudes are eating these cows for a week that have been cut up and there's still parts of them moving. And I'm pretty sure he even says they're moving. I should have gone and checked. Like they're – it's disgusting. It's enough to make someone a vegetarian, right? Or just like at least not eat living cows. So – um Finally, this is like that final leg like, of the trip when you ever wonder how Odysseus ends up completely by himself? This is how. Because Zeus is like, I mean, well, Helios, once again, a little bit of a tattletale. But this time, he's totally involved. He's like, these dudes ate my cows. Zeus is like, okay, well, I mean, we can't have that. And he blows up Odysseus' ship with a lightning bolt. And Odysseus is left the only survivor. So that's like, that's pretty harsh, right? Okay. Now, there's one last story I want to tell. Okay, I'm going to draw a better picture of uh, Helios because I feel like I haven't – I drew a little tiny picture. I drew a picture of him standing there like not doing anything. But I actually – he's the sun. He moves across the sky every night. I mean every day. Why do I keep saying night? He's a pretty dynamic figure. So here he is 
I draw him like, as you can see, very elongated and on flame because of the Titanic build of his. Now, this was a very familiar sight to the ancient Greeks. So I talk about like how um, in your normal life you could expect, if you were an ancient Greek who believed in the gods, you could expect to, you know, maybe have an encounter with Hestia or Hermes or some of the other more domestic gods. But to have an encounter with Helios, you just had to look up every day. He was there. Even if he's behind clouds, you knew he was there. And he would ride this chariot across the sky, bringing light to everyone, gods, mortals, monsters, whomever. Remember how we said he had a couple kids? Circe we're saving for another episode, but we're going to talk about Phaethon. There's a lot of different accounts of this story. Uh, the one I like is from Ovid. So this is actually a little bit later. This is, a, this is a Roman version of it, but he tells the kind of best version. Ovid is a, he's a mortal, a mortal, not immortal. Even though his dad is this Titan, God of the sun himself, he's got a mortal mother. So he is, but he's, you know, it's still a pretty important thing. He's a prince of Egypt. Which I think that's a cool detail, too. It's like, oh, Egypt. And, like, you know, there was a lot of, like, sun worship in Egypt, so it all makes sort of sense. And uh, here's something we've heard before. Although, actually, maybe you haven't. If you swear on the river Styx, even if you were a god, even if you were the sun, even if you were Zeus, that is an unbreakable oath. And we've seen this happen. Zeus swore on the river Styx to give Dionysus' his mother, Semele, anything she wanted. That ended badly for her. You'll see it in the book Dionysus. I'll probably do an episode eventually. You have to be really careful when you force a god to give you a wish that you they think, because they can't say no because you swore in the river Styx. It's an unbreakable bond. So if you say like, say you're Phaethon, and you had been given a f wish by your dad. He, he swore on the river Styx to give you anything you want. And you travel to the end of the world and you go visit him at his palace. And you're like... Hey, Pop, can I get the keys to the car? I mean, can I, like, borrow your chariot and ride it across the sky? And he's like, man, Phaethon, look at that and be like, no, maybe that's a bad idea. Don't do the thing. You swore in the river Styx, which is what Phaethon did. So against his better judgment, because he kind of knows this is going to end poorly. I mean, he definitely knows this is going to end poorly. Helios lets his mortal son, Phaethon, take this chariot. And at first, Phaethon's having a great time. He's like, woo, this is awesome. I'm I mean, think about it. You're flying through the sky. There's these four flaming horses in front of you. Um, I guess it's not quite as bright as if it had been with him there himself, but the horses and the chariot themselves are on fire. And it's really hot. And the horses, have you ever ridden a horse? Okay, I, I've ridden horses a few times. Horses can definitely tell when you don't know what you're doing. And they start acting like jerks. So these horses are used to the sun itself holding on to them. And they're like, who is this guy? And they start acting up. And they start pulling all over the place. And Phaethon can't control it. And the sun starts weaving across the sky in these crazy things. And Ob the reason I like Ovid's description is he really gets into it. He's describing how like the chariot comes flying down and like how it's burning all these various mountains of Greece that they're catching on flame. And like this smoke's coming up and there's like, there's, there's like inland seas that are being dried up and people like all over the place, people are suffering and creatures are suffering. And it gets so bad that they just like, they, this can't happen anymore. And so then, um, once again, Zeus has to step in. And he's like, uh, what were you thinking, Helios? Helios like, I'm sorry, River Sticks. Zeus is like, oh, man, I get it. But as he's swooping down, Phaethon, in this out-of-control chariot, Zeus throws a lightning bolt and blows up the chariot. I should mention, like, at this point, Phaethon himself was being, like, burnt by the flames. Like, he's breathing in, the, like, the descriptions Ava does are great. He's breathing in, like, hot air, and his lungs are being scorched. And he's in agony, too. So Zeus blows him up and puts him out of his misery. Doesn't put him out of his dad's misery, though. This is a, as you can imagine, this is a super sad day for Helios. He lost his son, and it was kind of his fault. It was kind of his son's fault, really, but... I don't think you're going to take comfort in knowing that your son forced you for this. And this is why I said how every single day he rises above and goes, makes his arc across the sky, right? But that, that day, that next day, so the world was not burned clean, but let's say it was given a good singe. There's a lot of fires everywhere. A lot of buildings were destroyed. A lot of mountaintops especially were like scorched. He was, he, he was burned the top stuff. Forests burned. There's forest fires and stuff. It was a bad scene. And the next day, 
Helios didn't rise. There was a full day where Helios, in his grief, he just didn't rise. And it's kind of interesting how you could you could kind of look at this as sort of like, you could almost see how this could have really happened. Let's take away the idea of like a dude riding in a chariot. And let's take the idea even of maybe the sun itself being like kind of swooping over and burning. Okay. So um, imagine, if you will, like a bunch of volcanoes erupt, right? Burning mountaintops. Because Ovid specifically talks about burning mountaintops a lot, right? And if you know, if you hear about like when volcanoes erupt, they cast all this smoke and soot into the air and the sun itself is blotted out. So I read this story. I'm like, is this, is this an account of like some volcano erupted and then the next day they didn't see the sun? I mean, that's kind of a cool idea, right? I don't know. I mean, this is just me. This is just me throwing out ideas. And I understand that these are pretty wacky ideas. And there's like a lot of fringe science that plays with these ideas where you read myths and you say, this is something that really happened. I don't want to be that guy. But that one just seems so clear that there was probably something like that. And Helios, even after that one day, he kind of doesn't want to go up anymore. And the other gods are like, you have to. And they kind of make him go up and go through his things. This story, I really enjoy the story of Phaethon. This is a story that I would like to... I often talk about how after I finish Olympians with book 12, Dionysus, I'm going to do the four book series as Guardians, and then I want to come back and do more books on Greek mythology. Specifically stories that, um, because Olympians was called Olympians, had to really tie it into the actual Olympians, right? So I'm like, wouldn't it be cool to like tell stories that were about other gods, minor gods, demigods, monsters, whatever other things. And this is always one of the stories that's been in my pitch. I'm like, yeah, tell the story of Phaethon. I actually want to do it like a, a book that just about stories about flights gone wrong. And it would be, it would be three stories, right? It would be Phaethon, it'd be Bellerophon and Pegasus, and it'd be Icarus and Daedalus. In all these stories, somebody flies who isn't supposed to fly and something terrible happens to them. So watch for that book someday. Um, man, I went pretty long so far. I didn't really get to talk about how often we see this conflation between Apollo and Helios. And that's something, I think I talked about it in the Apollo episode a bit, so we can go see that more. But really quickly, that's really something that you see more in later times, like in the later Roman period. The ancient Greeks were pretty clear that they were different people. Like Apollo... He is a god of light, and he's radiant and beautiful and all these things, right? But he is, he's not the sun. But I think it was that idea of, like, the light and the sun kind of comes together. So, like, in the later Roman periods, like, shortly before they kind of just give up on the whole, like, Greek god, Roman god thing and just become, like, you know, the Holy Roman Empire and Christianity, you see that there's, like, at that point you'll start seeing Apollo as the sun. And I don't know what that's about. Maybe it's just that they just kind of like, they were just combining. I'm saying like the Olympians were always kind of expanding and absorbing lesser gods. And the Olympians were the big guys. So even the sun itself was a lesser god than Apollo. So he kind of took its position. We see this also with Artemis and Selene. I'll talk about that on Friday. Um, oh, I, I, did, I also want to mention, um, to give you an idea how he is like a, a quote unquote minor god, but pretty like major. Have you guys ever heard of the tight, the Colossus of Rhodes? So it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world of which only the pyramids survive. So these other things, we only have descriptions, but the Colossus of Rhodes was this Titanic statue of Helios. And some sources say it was so big that one foot was on one side of the Harbor and one foot was on the other. Most people nowadays think that's probably not true, but it's like, I forget how many, like how many meters tall or how many feet tall this thing is, but it was this enormous statue that eventually was toppled by an earthquake and, um, they never rebuilt it. Cause I, and I think the Oracle of Delphi is like, no, don't rebuild it. It's bad. And Delphi is controlled by Apollo. So maybe it's a conspiracy. I don't know. So man, I ended up talking a lot about Helios. I think the sun made me excited and I don't, <laughs> there's still more stuff I didn't get to, but, um, what I wanted to do now is if I could, is um, throw it open for questions. I don't know if people have asked questions already. I'll kind of zip through and see if anybody has this. 
Are they technically called the Hellenic gods? Um, somebody must be asking. Uh, the Hellenic gods is something that you will see uh, at times. Like that's normally refers to the Greek gods. Uh, Hellenic civilization is the Greek civilization. Um, I think Greco-Roman is probably the best term where it's more uh, conducive to both. Because um, if you watch the Apollo episode, we talk about this. There are pretty significant differences between the Greek and the Roman gods. It's not just always a case of where, okay, so he's Jupiter there and he's Zeus here. Sometimes there's real differences in characters. Famously, in the case of Apollo, there is no Roman equivalent. They only had the Greek version. And with Helios, he's this we see a lot. He is actually personified in myth and has a role where he's done, he has a personality. Uh, the Roman version of Sol, S-O-L, Sol, uh, he doesn't, he absorbs those myths later. Ovid is a Roman version, but he didn't have his own attendant mythology. Um, and then you kind of see in late, late antiquity, there's Sol Invictus, which is a whole other thing, but that's like another, salt, a, like a god cult for the sun, but not the same dude. Um, does Helios have a weapon? If so, can you tell me a story about him fighting with a weapon? Um, huh. So uh, I know that he, in some versions, he has, uh, in fact, I drew it here. He has like a fiery scourge that he uses to drive the horses. And if I recall correctly, in I think it's Hyginus's account of him fighting in the war against the Gigantes, because he sides with the Olympians, I think they mention that he has spears, that he has many piercing spears. Um, I think that is meant to symbolize the light radiating out from him. Um, one would be tempted to say that he has bow and arrow, but that's like definitely like the territory of Apollo. So I think that they were very much like, no, there's already getting people confused. We're not giving bow and arrow, but I'm pretty sure he uses spears. I think his real main power is the fact that he's the sun. So like he's pretty hot. I wish I knew offhand how hot the sun is, but I'm pretty sure it's at least a zillion degrees. So I think he could just burn the heck out of anything he needs to. Um, what did the Greeks think was happening during a solar eclipse? Well, that's a great question because he actually is associated with solar eclipse ideas, right? And <clears throat> you have to go back pretty far because remember I said the ancient Greeks were super smart? They, one of the ways they figured out that the earth was round and they kind of figured out what was going on with eclipses was because they, well, okay, they saw like, like an eclipse of the sun where like the earth was blocking it out and they're like, oh, that's because the earth is round. So they figured out pretty soon what was actually really happening, that somehow he was traveling around. The whole idea of him with the disc and stuff, that's pretty old and... I would have to do some research, which I really didn't do research on this, to see at one point, how did they kind of explain it once they, they knew, they knew from about like 500 BCE that the earth was round. So for a long part of the time when they believed in these gods, they were like, we know that this is a globe, that it's an orb. So I'm not 100% sure. They don't have any cool, that I'm aware of, any cool myths where like it's some sort of attack on the sun. Like, you know, if you look at the Norse, like their solar eclipse ideas, it's like this giant wolf named Garm that's like tr eating the sun. Like they have some cool ideas of like that. I don't think the ancient Greeks had that. It was probably like, I don't know. I'm gonna have to get back to you though. That's a really good question. Um, did Helios's children have children? Uh, yes. So, um, oh, why is that popping up? So, uh, Helios, he had, like I said, a few immortal people that kind of like were descended from him. But mostly I think he's known for having mortal um, descendants. I mentioned Circe. Circe goes on to have children. In fact, Medea is, I think, Circe's daughter or granddaughter. I forgot. I have to check that out. Um, a lot of times Helios is associated with the ruling families of different kingdoms too. Um, I think the, uh, the founding king of Corinth was regarded as one of his sons. Um, I think another founding king of Rhodes. So there would be entire familial lines that would claim some level of ancestorship with Helios. Um, somebody asked, doesn't Helios have a third kid, Pasiphae? Yes, in some instances, Pasiphae is a kid of uh, Helios. Is he married? Now that's actually kind of interesting because um, if you look at the genealogies, a lot of times they're kind of vague on who the mother is. 
There's normally uh, Clymene, who is, I believe, an Oceanity, uh, one of the Oceanities, who is normally mentioned as being um, the mother of Phaethon. I don't know if she is of Circe as well. And then I so I don't know that he's married as much as he has a lot of different women he's been with. I mean, you think about it, he'd be a really awful husband because he's literally always working or coming back from work. His entire life is flying over the sky and then coming back. So he's not around very much. So maybe like he just liked the single life. You know, he'd go home and eat mac and cheese by himself while he watches reruns. Um, Medea is Circe's niece, daughter of Acedes of Alcolchus. Thank you, Estreas. Sometimes, you know, uh, I just can't think that fast. Uh, the Minotaur, Ariadne, Phaedra. Oh, so we're talking about Pasiphae being the kids that she had. Yeah. So Pasiphae, uh, in case you don't know, Pasiphae is married to King uh, Minos of Crete, and she is the fa- mother of both Ariadne, who, you know, famously betrayed her father to help Theseus, the biggest jerk in the world, and later marries Dionysus, so really trades up, and the Minotaur. So she, so I guess, yeah. But the thing with Pasiphae is I don't know that all sources agree that she is a kid. I think that's just in a few sources. You know, it's always worth mentioning. Um, Greek mythology doesn't have like a specific Bible or one specific set of beliefs. There's a lot of different versions and they don't always agree. I mean, you go back to the two oldest sources we have, Hesiod and Homer, and they often don't agree about stuff. And so what I've done with Olympians is a lot of times I do a pick and choose. And there's certain um, mythographers, uh, which means literally someone who writes myths down, who I give a little bit more credence to their work, so I maybe will rank them a little bit higher in the way that they come together. Sometimes, because I care about this stuff and it's really not important, I really care about the chronology of these things. And so I have to use the ones that make sense time-wise. And sometimes uh, I'll, I'll, if there's one that where a character who doesn't normally have agency or control has more of a role in their story, like Persephone, like being able to choose for herself, I'll go that route because it makes me sad when she's just this kind of pawn in her own story. Um, is Cersei immortal? I don't know if she is. I would assume so. I can't think of any story where her life is super in danger. Um, and she certainly... Okay, so having read Madeline Miller's book, Cersei, she's certainly extremely long-lived. Um, I don't remember if they actually come out and say that she's immortal. I think that's one of those things that's kind of open for interpretation. I could see no reason why she wouldn't be, though. Because she has two fully divine parents. You don't normally start seeing, like, the non-immortality creeping in until you get down to, like, nymphs as parents and stuff like that. <laughs> so many different versions. Yes. Um, that's true. I remember reading that Pasiphae was the mother goddess of Crete. Yeah, there's a whole theory. Um, so back when I lived in... Um, I lived briefly, like, for a few... Like, for, like, six months, eight months in Rome. And from there, I traveled around to the Mediterranean, did a lot of research for this. And when you go to Crete, or Crete, as they call it, um, you could see, like, it's one of the oldest sources of civilization in the Mediterranean region. And there definitely was a belief system in place that they had that was kind of later co-opted by, to use a term we just introduced, the Hellenic gods. And there is this figure that you will see a lot She's dressed in the typical Minoan dress, which is like bare-breasted, but like a gown. She's holding these two snakes. She has this kind of funny hat on. And a lot of people have interpreted that as being Pasiphae and that she was originally like the major goddess that they had. And after um, the Minoan civilization crumbled and was co-opted by the larger Greek-speaking civilizations, and they kind of relegated them to the role of these stories... They didn't have room for her as in the Hera role, right? So instead, they kind of cast her as this queen who like gave birth to a monster. A lot of these, a lot of goddesses and gods, you'll see, get kind of like downgraded. We talked about this in the Medusa episode, which you can see on YouTube. Medusa's name is literally an archaic word that means queen, and she just becomes this monster. But there's this belief that she's also this goddess before that, like maybe from another pantheon that. When they kind of absorbed him, they're like, well, she can't be the queen of the gods because we already got one. So let's maybe make her just a monster. Poor Medusa. She really has a rough time. 
Um, now, this is an interesting question. How did Helios know how far away he had to be from the Earth so that the Earth didn't catch on fire? Now, let's come... I'm going to have a couple... I don't know that there's a definitive answer to this. This is me spitballing. Um, there's definitely references to parts of the Earth that are sun-scorched, particularly at the ends. So maybe as he gets closer, as he's coming in for a landing, he kind of... He can see everything, right? So maybe he can just kind of notice... Like, as he's coming down, he sees, like, oh, look at that. That, like, that grass is turning brown because I'm getting a little close. So that must be the limit. I also imagine, as a dude who is completely constructed of flame, or at least completely sheathed in flame, I never really established. I assume he's made of gas, just like the actual sun is, um, burning gas. Maybe he can actually control, to a certain degree, his temperature, how much he emanates. So maybe, like, he, again, taking note of the world, he's like... Oh, maybe burning a little hot today. Maybe I'll just dial it back. I mean, he's been alive for a long time. He's had a lot of chances to perfect this. Uh, amazing how the history has transformed the gods. One of the things I really love about Greek mythology, there's a billion things, but I really do love the way that it's not like the beliefs were concrete. They were always changing. There was always things that were morphing about the way they believed in the gods. Like I've mentioned this a million times, or even earlier in this episode, how the Olympians themselves, the those gods kind of expanded and absorbed other gods. Like that's really fascinating to me. And how the how you could find remnants of earlier versions of the stories that exist still. That you're kind of like are a little incongruous now. The one I always go for that, one of the oldest stories about Hera and Heracles. First off, he's named Heracles, the glory of Hera. And there's been other reasons why. Like, oh, he's trying... Her mom was trying to make Hera feel better. I don't think that would work. I don't know. You have, like... You're, you're like... You have an affair with her husband and you name the kid after you? I don't think that... I think that's going to make you more angry. Now, I like the idea... Like, okay, so there's... Basically, there's this old... There's this myth. We all know the Milky Way galaxy. We've heard it. That comes from the ancient Greeks. And they actually believe that Hera breastfed baby Heracles when he wasn't even, he was Alcides, baby Alcides, and he sucked so greedily, and when she pulled him away, there was a spray, and that created the Milky Way. And that's a really hard story to reconcile with the Hera, who in later stories actually makes Heracles go nuts and murder his family. Like, I hate that version of the story. It makes Hera look awful, it makes Heracles look awful, it makes everyone look awful, and plus it involves a lot of kids people getting killed. So I like the idea that she's actually trying to make him a better hero. She's still super mad. She's not pleased that Zeus went and had an affair with Alcmene and had two kids. Well, one, depending on how you view um, uh, Alcides. Uh, not Al What is his brother's name? I'm forgetting his brother's name. Oh, darn it. Uh, something Achilles. It's also Achilles. Anyway. Um, there are myths that the star, that Hyperion was very wise. Perhaps he taught his son how to be the this, this son. <laughs> That's a hard sentence to say. Um, so Hyperion is one of the orig OG Titans, one of the original six. He was the Titan of the East, um, where, Hyper uh, where Helios would rise from. Um, I, he is associated with, I think... I think it's like the reckoning of time as told by the heavens, which I think accounts for the fact that he has this wisdom inherent in him. I like that idea that maybe he like took his son. Under, I mean, you got to think you give birth to this flaming son. Who's like, a, like a light. You're like, Oh, you're going to make everything warm and give light and grow. Like, let me help you out a little bit. Don't just like stick him loose one day. And he's like, running, Oh dad, we're really bad. I burned the whole earth. So yeah, he probably helped out. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe Helios should have helped Phaethon, right? Um, my dad wants to know, who is the Greek god or goddess of sunscreen? Oh, that is Coppertonus. Yeah, um, also the god of pulling down bikinis. It's a little bit inappropriate. Um, it was 12 titans, not six. I was making the distinction. I was being a bit sexist there because there were 12 titans, but the there's the six female titans, the titanesses, and then there's the six male titans. Probably shouldn't use. It's like using the term actress. It's probably archaic, but you know what? We're talking ancient Greek mythology. It's all super archaic. <laughs> How do some children? Why do some children of the gods become gods and others don't? Well, for the most part, and this is a good question. You will notice. Oh my gosh, we're almost out of time. So this is gonna be the last question for today. 
Um, this shuts off abruptly at one hour, by the way. For the most part, you only see a child become a god if both parents are divine. They don't have to be both of Olympian stock. There's actually very few that have both Olympians. But if they are like maybe one of the parents is a Titan or like a second generation Titan or even in some instances like Athena, like in Oceanity, they, they are derived. There's a pretty direct familial line where they're all divine to, from immortal types. Um, it gets a little bit hazier once you start involving a nymph because nymphs were not immortal, but were long and long lived. So maybe the kid is kind of a god. Maybe the kid's not. That might explain for why Pan is the one god who's thought to have died, perhaps, according to that one account by Plutarch, because Pan's mother was Penelope, who was a nymph. So it's getting a little bit diluted there, right? And then you have the demigods where it's apparent is... Mortal, although as we discover when we ex ex examine these, oftentimes these demigods have a little bit extra god on the other side. Like Heracles, you know, his dad is Zeus, his mom was a mortal woman, Alcmene, but Alcmene was descended from both, uh, was descended from uh, Perseus, who is the son of Zeus. Oh, something's got knocked over big. So uh, he is the, he's the son of, he's got a little bit extra god going on in there. And that's mostly how it comes down to him. So, um, <laughs> sunscreen passes medicine. People are obsessed with sunscreen today. I'm glad. I hope you're all using enough SPF. Um, thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, if you're going to send me some drawings, and I surely hope you do, and, you know, I hope that we see a lot of drawings of, like, you know, scenes with Helios in there, please, you know, because he's already been lurking in our pictures, please send it to me at my email, georgeoconnorbooks at gmail.com. And uh, you can catch always catch other episodes on my YouTube, youtube.com slash YouTube slash George Olympians. If you joined late and you want to see this, uh, it's going to be saved on my stories. I'm also going to be putting up on my YouTube shortly after this. So just watch for that later today. And I will see you all on Friday where uh, we're going to be talking about the sister of the sun, Selene, the moon. Thank you all for tuning in. Bye-bye.